So, most of everybody knows who I am, Jason. So I draw. I do. <laughs> I draw Invisible and some other books. Okay. Um, the process that I use is pretty old school when it comes to my art, my traditional art, or what I'm going to get to printing is always done on 11 by 17 Bristol board. Now the reason I use Bristol board is because you can really hammer into this stuff. Um, it's not a light paper. I'm going to give everybody paper here. I'm going to give you all pencils. I'm going to give you a little bit of everything just so you can see how I do it and what I use to get to that. Um, I'm so Oh, it's a, it's a really good time. Do we want to get out one more table? Yeah. Yeah. If you guys want to just, yeah, we can do that. whatever you guys want to do, is I'm cool with it. So, one, two, three, four, here you go. And pencils are here. Okay. Yeah. This is Bristol board. And then pass these out. It's a blue pencil. Everybody gets a blue and, and a purple. All right, so this, the technical specs on this Bristol board is, most of the time Bristol board is a 100 pound press. It's about as heavy as you're going to get in papers. Uh, you guys want to lean on paper? I really don't know if there's another, I really don't know if there's a heavier press paper, but I really don't care either. I'm sure there is. The, the point of it all is to be able to work on this. You want one more table? This one more table. There's plenty of room. Can you pull, pull another table out. Maybe Bart wants to do it too. Maybe. <laughs> See, what kind of cartoon would I make? <laughs> so, uh, what's everybody's name here? I'm Sandy. Sandy? Uh, Micah. 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 Everybody's got their stuff. Good. We're just going to keep plugging. I need on. a piece. Okay, yep. This is going to be bizarre. Yeah, so if, you, if, you, if you're holding this, it really stands up to a lot of abuse. When you're, when you're penciling and inking, uh, a lot of it involves your sketching process, right? Because you're never really going to be able, I call it 2D drawing um, or shooting from the hip, is what I call it, where you can, some people try to draw without sketching out first and it's a critical error because you're never going to build the depth and the, the dimension that you need by just trying to fire from your hip. You might be good but you're never going to be that good and every professional you see out there that works in the comic book medium is all going to tackle it relatively the same way. So a dual tone or duo tone is basically what you have for pencils right now. The blue is the lightest on the spectrum and the reason I use blues and that purple is because it would be categorized as non-photo and that is only a color spectrum that is it so when you go to reproduce or you go to uh, remove the color it happens fast and it's all gone so you eliminate the, re the need to erase I'm going to show you guys portfolios here and we can just set them out right there because I do have enough of the work. Some of it has original art. Okay, so this is going to be for you guys. Never mind the price tags. These are for whenever I'm at conventions. I set these bad boys out and let people go through them. Okay, so you'll see on that Bristol board, you'll see variations of blue and purple. Okay, do you guys see them? Is yeah. there purple on there or just blue? Just blue on there. All right, I didn't have to do a background scene. The reason, again, I use the non-photo instead of like a traditional gray pencil is because I'm inking over my pencils 
and whenever I scan these things off, I can just go in and whack the color right out of there, and I'm only left with my inks. Okay? You scan it with what? I scan it on an 11 by 17 flat bed flat bed scanner. And so when you're scanning it, just you're left without just with the picture without the. You'll get a raw file. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I have stuff for the class. So, essentially, I don't have this in invisible, the blue lines, because I just run with it. But, here you go. And you're an artist, so I will give you three of these so you can ink on them. Ooh, cool. So, essentially... What did you do? You photo or you made a copy of your blue line? Yeah, so the original piece that I did of this is just like that. And I wanted to do, I normally traditionally don't do just pencils. I do pencils and my own inks. So seldom do I get just a pencil cover or an opportunity to do a pencil cover. So when the opportunity presented itself for Necroman 3, I jumped on it because it was just a good time. But I don't have the time to do that. I don't work on a big book or a big company where I'm solely the penciler. Now, if I was just a penciler and I worked in a traditional medium of just pencil, uh, of the pencil, a gray pencil, the colors that you have now in your hand with those pencils, they would do the same process. They would scan it and they would zap the gray, right? And it would pick up all the, the tones of the gray and then they would change it for that blue, print it out so an inker could have it, if that makes any sense. So they right? don't ink the original one? No. Never. Oh, wow. Never. I do because I'm my own artist. If um, you'll meet an artist that'll pencil and sometimes he'll hand it off to an inker and that's the original piece of art that's the traditional way of doing it uh, from the beginning of, of comics really is when they did it um, with this though the advantage is you never have to erase when you're using non-photo because when you erase you can just destroy the work you're on and it's frustrating to draw over something three or four times and then eventually this stuff will give right like we could just erase it ink it erase it ink it and sometimes you're just not going to like what you do it's just a struggle we all face right and you're going to hit it with white out and do all sorts of things well the bottom line is you're going to destroy the surface of the paper and when that happens and you start inking it'll bleed and leach and spread and now you're in trouble you got to learn to stop and walk away with this process, though, you don't have to do any of that. I never erase unless uh, when I'm trying to refine my, my heavy sketches. When I'm sketching, sometimes I'm just loose. You know, I'm just trying to get a feel for it. I usually thumbnail out. Um, if you think about it like a director, right, you have a little subframe. It's, it's a thumbnail. It's like, don't waste your time or paper on something that's your own idea of a piece, you can draw a little mini picture in there, like this. Guess who doesn't have a non-photo pencil on? We're just going to run and gun. We could lend you one. Yeah. Not, I didn't sharpen any of them. I, I even have my um, pencils set aside at home that I forgot. So I'll use this as the, the basis. If I, if I wasn't sure of the pose, because sometimes what's in your head isn't necessarily going to translate well to what's going to be on the paper, right? You can have these elaborate, amazing ideas, and then you try to execute it on the paper, and you're just going to fail. It's just it's, it's the way it happens, so you can't be afraid of it. No, it's okay. I'm just going to sketch out for a minute so I can show you. I mean, you're all... So essentially, there's a thumbnail. I'm just getting the form of what I want to show, right? There's no detail. I'm just sketching out very loose. When I'm sketching out on here, just trying to get a feel for it, same same deal. You know, you're getting the, the shapes of the heads right because you're going to stack shapes and sizes and all sorts of things to get to the forms that you want to get to, right? You, again, you, you got to build it. Once I'm done with the pencils, or happy enough with the pencils, I'll move on to ink. But I try to get the most important parts out of the way first. I, I tackle the hardest, most obnoxious stuff first um, to get it out of the way. 
So then everything after that is a cakewalk. And usually when I'm inking or penciling, I have this revolving door theory at my drawing table. Because sometimes you'll get stuck and you'll hit a wall or you'll hit a block. So I like to have five or six pages that I'm constantly rotating through and going around. And when I finish a page, I just keep moving. So there's a stockpile of art to my right side on my drawing table uh, that I just keep working through. And that's how I beat art artist block because when you're doing books, you have to do books, okay? Like I can't take a week to do a panel. You know, you have to move. And I'm not saying rush the job by any means. You'll get into a flow and the more comfortable you become with your art and your style and your craft, the faster you'll become. When I'm doing books, which is all the time, I'll have sequential work, which is essentially the artist telling a story. And then I'll have what you would call a splash page, which is in front of you guys right now, or a cover image. That's a lot of information in one page, right? Like, that's, that's telling a story in, in one shot. So when you're doing sequential, it's a different beast. And you can't really stop because you got to keep going. Otherwise, you're going to have a big chunk of time missing in your career, you know? Like, what were you doing at that point? Why weren't you working? There's really no excuse for it besides laziness, because if you're dedicated enough, you should be doing this every day. You, as an artist, you don't really have much of a choice. It's just something that gets to you. Uh, I, I wake up, have a cup of coffee, and I start drawing immediately. Then I go to my big boy job. Then I get home, make dinner, hang out with the wife, she goes to bed earlier than I do, and then I stay up for two hours after that drawing as well. So it's, it's an everyday process. And if I don't get a chance to sit at my drawing table, I'm doing something at least to further uh, my art or my career. Um, sometimes, if you're coloring your own work, you have to make time for that. And I don't do that at my drawing table. I do that completely on the computer. So once I have the, the, those scanned off, this would be my inks over my pencils. So you can see, it doesn't have to match. I'm not necessarily, so many people worry about their lines when essentially you're, you're kind of just tracing and adding texture and tone to it. Right? There's a, there's some slight variations. You can see where I use shading and stuff uh, to ink. Inking is the final process in the analog drawing. So once I'm here, right here, it's ready. We're ready to scan and we're ready to color. Now, a lot of times when I ink, it's great to come back with whiteout, right? You can cover a lot of space inking, markers, <laughs> right? And then come back in, hit it with a gel pen or a whiteout pen, and add details all through it, just to give it a little bit more texture, a little more tone. The best way I can show you that is with the cover, the variant cover to Invisible, which would be this. So I didn't map all the whiteout, right? I just hammered it with black and then came back in with white out and added a bunch of little details to it all through everywhere, right? A lot of the, the blues and stuff I don't really care about because I'm not concerned with the physical art, if you will. I'm concerned about the process. How do I get to the final color version or the final print version, right? So I'll pencil it and ink it. Usually I do them together, right? I'll start penciling out, I'll sketch out a page, I'll start refining my pencils. Once I'm comfortable with where the story's going, I'll start putting the borders on it, right? How I'm gonna tell my panel story sequentially, then I'll start inking. And then you just hammer it. Like inking is, I like inking more than I like penciling, so I pencil just to get to my inks, if that makes any sense, because I know that the final version is gonna be the version most people are going to see anyway without the blue lines and the fuzziness. Yeah? Well, what kind of, when you say you're inking, are you using your Sharpie? Is that the, what you're doing? 
No, I use, well, I have a really nice set of rapidiographs, which is a Kohenor product, and it's actually just a drafting pen, a technical drafting pen that you can unscrew, pull the reservoir, fill it up with India ink, put it back in, and keep going. Uh, I use those, the 2.5 millimeter, because that'll give me a very nice, solid, steady black line. A rapidograph is impossible to beat with its consistency because it's actually India ink. This is an alcohol-based, and you're, the only way you're going to get India ink on paper is through a, a expensive technical pen, a quill pen, or a brush. They don't really sell the pens for India ink because India ink will bind it up, gunk it up, and junk it up. Like India ink is a monster to work with, but you can't beat it. Period. You get, it's so indestructible, if you will, if you will, and it's so rich in its color that it makes inking a whole heck of a lot easier. Now, I don't use that for all of the stuff because sometimes you want an alcohol base, so I'll use a couple different kinds of pens, right? So I'll use Monster Sharpies for big fills. If it's a monster fill, I'll get a brush with India ink and hit it, but the problem with that is India ink, even on Bristol board, and volume will warp and buckle the pages, right? So you have to, you, you, I prefer alcohol for big runs, but if you want to hit your tight corners and, and, and pull the piece in, you're going to hit it with India ink. If you hit Bristol board raw with India ink, it'll buckle it. If you hit it with a Sharpie first and then India ink, you've already saturated the paper and it won't buckle you, which is a double process. Um, it's a good process, so when you hit India ink with whiteout, it pops more than, say, this, because an alcohol-based ink will eat whiteout in a different way than an India ink will. India ink will have a nice, shy, like, tight edge. This necessarily won't. Inking is my favorite part. This is where you're going to spend most of your time. If you're just penciling and inking, right? Coloring is such a biscuit. It is not my favorite thing to do. It is. It's not my favorite thing to do. And I guess I'm just so old school that I learned to draw the traditional way um, in front of me. But there's a digital world out there that you can also do. I try to melt the two, marry the two, because the advantages of digital coloring is the consistency. Okay? You're never going to beat it unless you're hand painting everything and you're spending months on a panel. It's almost impossible to be digital. The reason being is it takes out the human aspect in a way. Watercolors, markers, colored pencils, some beautiful work like that. But when it comes to production of a book, you want consistency and you need it to be consistent every time, all the time, exactly the same way human hands, you're never going to get that. Um, so that's why when you scan off, you're going to clean up all your lines. Now we're ready to color. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Any anybody questions? has a question, you just fire them. I have about me. six questions. So, go ahead. Okay. So, um, first of all, is this all trial and error? Like learning that you have to put the Sharpie down before you put the ink down? Did you, this is all just stuff you taught yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was uh, younger, and my mother had gotten me, um, she bought me one rapidograph, or rapidograph, however you say it, in high school. And it's, I still have the pen. I've got a great story about that. But uh, it was a three, three, five. It's, it's the great tip going over. And it's beautiful. It is the workhorse, like that consistency between, um, see now I forget exactly what it is. There's 3.5 and 2.5. Those are the workhorses of my line weight. Um, because when I'm working in 11 by 17, it'll give me the right weight. So when I reduce it, it'll give me a sharper, consistent line, if you will. Can you spell that repeatable? Art, like rapid, O, Graph. They're great pens. Uh, you, if you're going to get one, you're going to.
you're going to have to be dedicated to these pens. I don't mean to like, dedicate your life, but you're going to have to keep up with them. Okay, uh, you got to stare at them. I have a carousel. Okay, so my mom bought me the Rapidograph, and I started that way when I was a kid, and I just started hammering it as best as I could. I, first, I started with watercolors, and that was a nightmare, right? Because you can't use watercolors on a Bristol board. You can't use watercolors very well on a copy paper or a cheap sketchbook or any of that other stuff. You're going to, oh, it's going to be so bad. I've made a million mistakes when it comes to art, right? Art is trial and error. What works for you? What can you do right? What are you doing wrong? Like, as an artist, you're always analyzing yourself more so than anybody else is going to do. It's just the nature of the beast itself, right? So when it came to inking, Patty, it washed out, right? I was really t so proud of this work. And I remember because my mom bought me this, uh, this brush set, right, for inking big things because I was blasting through Sharpies. My mom was like, I'm not, I'm not going to keep buying you Sharpies, Jason. Uh, so I tried it, and I was really happy about this piece, and I think it was a silver surfer when I was in high school. A big, the biggest piece of like Bristol board I could find, and I'm like, I'm not even going to mess around with the Sharpies this time. I'm going to end you ink that sucker, and man, did it pucker. Mm -hmm. The whole piece, like if the silver surfer was here, it ruined it, right? It, it was, I was so sad. I was like, so sad. I tried to like scrape part of the India ink off because where she buckled, it did this really weird rippling thing. So when I tried to scrape it off, it made it worse. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to put Sharpie over that which made it worse, and then finally it was just ground in where you could almost like, you poke a hole right through it. Um, but, trial and error, trial and error. I try to avoid, um, I don't know, I try, I try to avoid making mistakes, but I know they're gonna happen. Right, so this was like 30 years ago, right? Yeah, you're 50? 30 years, so, so there 45, was a... I'm 45. <laughs> so there, there wasn't the, there wasn't the kind of Apple or software there is now. Mm -hmm. So did you color it in by hand too? Oh yeah, that was well. Okay, so I I got this book called um, The Marble Way, and what that explains is how Stanley and Jack Kirby used to just vibe with each other. You know, they would be like, I want to do. A story about a team of four people. One's going to be a rock. Someone can turn invisible. <laughs> human Torch and a Mr. Elastic. And Jack Kirby is like, I'm going to draw that for you. Um, but Jack Kirby used this process as well. But non-photo really wasn't a thing back then. So the way they did it, this is how I started. Is they would draw very lightly in gray graphite pencil. And they would ink over that. And then they would they didn't have like the scanning technology that we do today so they would run plates they would do some ancient like caveman crap right but that tells you how the process is done um, that tells you basically what you need to know I think in the 70s non photo became a thing okay when it I need to know what non photo non photo okay so if you look at that pencil right there the blue one you were to read the barrel it says non photo on it Non-photo is an indicator on the color spectrum, right? You go white to black. If you were to go to a copy machine and be like, I need this non-photo, it's going to spit out part of that spectrum. And that can be blue, purple, red. It just hits a very small line in the color spectrum that photocopiers and copiers in general don't... How can I say it won't want to reproduce well because it's such a fine spectrum of color. Oh. It wants to hit bowls. It wants to, where she hits, where non-photo hits, it's very easy to take it out. So when Chad got his pictures, he got a picture like this, <clears throat> he would just click a button on the machine and all those blue lines would disappear. So the computer knew instantly to take That's anything non -photo. that yes. was non-photo and make it white like the rest of the white. So it was really cool to watch because it made, I mean, so you can imagine if Chad had to erase, physically erase all that blue, that would have been lengthy. So it's really two layers. If you think about the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
again, I'm not, I don't necessarily consider that fine art. I call this production art because my end goal is production at the end, okay? People love this art. That's where you're going to make money is selling your original art. But at the end game, you want to bring them into your art, so I want to get the print. Using non-photo is just a spectrum. That's it. So if you were to type into Google, what is a non-photo spectrum, it's going to pop up for you. And those colors are in that spectrum. That purple is a little over. The reason I go a little over on the spectrum is because if you're building depth, um, it's really easy to get lost in your piece with just one color, right? It's, it's hard to differentiate the background from the foreground sometimes. And I'll add a little bit of purple just to help my eyes a little bit with the details. So when you're inking it, and you see the purple, that makes you think, okay, I'm going to need to... Usually my goal is to always cover purple. I don't really care about blue because it's easier to take care of, but I always want to hammer purple. Because that's not necessary. Okay, so the actual purple on the non-photo scale is two steps below the purple you have there. So I go two steps up, so whenever I'm inking, I know to get it, like, cover that purple up. And then when you remove it, the same process applies, but the only problem is sometimes it can leave a fuzzy gray. If that, I, and I think I have examples of that too. Somewhere. Maybe. Usually I give these things out at appearances. So if I'm signing stuff, no, I don't have any example of hairiness is what I call it. Yeah. Sorry. So did you have a different writer for Necroman or did you write it? Um... Well, Mark and I used the Marvel way. And how we did that was we just sort of brainstormed along. Uh, so, do you guys know Patty and I did the book Invisible together? Does everybody know that? Okay. So, the process of working with different writers and publishers is as unique as the writers and publishers. Patty gave me a script that was great. You know, like it laid everything out for me and I could tell her direction, right? Like I knew what point A to point B was. Uh, with Mark, we sort of do it the Marvel way, which means we'll just bullcrap with each other and be like, I think it would be cool to do this. Like Necroman, we take almost a horror approach. Uh, so we want to induce a little gags and what a gag is in the horror industry is like a um, an occurrence if you will in some horror movies like Friday the 13th a horror gag would be when somebody gets like their head chopped off right so in Necroman our gag was he was going to try to strike with his guts or in issue two <laughs> in issue two the horror gag was that he was saving a bunch of kids from a burning orphanage what a great hero and he didn't want to drop the babies because the fireman's um, catch thingy, mm -hmm. springs broke, so he had to figure out how to lower the babies, and how he did that was with his intestines. You know, so, so that was the horror was awesome. <laughs> So, well, well, if you think about it, Necroman sort of revolves around a few gags, right? Like, picking up the wall, his arm explodes out, right? Like, it, it revolves around oh, gags, whereas... Invisible, invisible revolves around the character, right? Invisible is a story, uh, a character-driven story. Necroman is a lot of fun, like a horror gag-driven thing. Every issue we're gagging out, if you will. Um, so Mark and I will have a brainstorming session, and we'll figure out a comic book is a format of, say, one page to 28 pages. So you have this amount of time to tell your story. So you're going to start chopping that section that section up, right? Because every one of these sections you want to tell stories, even if all these stories lead to the end and pull it together, or you're leading up to the next issue, um, or you're finishing up the story, whatever you got to do, you're going to cut your volume into sections and then tell your story sequentially throughout there. Necroman would try to hit <coughs> just for shits and giggles because it's a good time. So did you go 
guys say, um, okay, so there's this, there's this page where he's coming out and all these people are clamoring at him and his intestines are part of his uterine belt, which is hysterical now that you told me that. Um, and by the way, cut off one of his thumbs. Did, yeah. Did that happen? Did you come up with a cut off thumb? Did I you did. I did because here's what I wanted to do. Okay. Like my long goal with the thumb is I'm going to get people to root for the thumb. <laughs> Yep, they're gonna be they're gonna be cheering a thumb for Where's the thumb? <laughs> so in issue issue three. Yeah, issue three. They find the thumb. Oh, okay. But not Necroman. But essentially the thumb wants to find Necroman. It wants to go back to where he goes. So this thing's inching along. But they get <laughs> Yeah, guys, I totally set it up so people will absolutely cheer the thumb on. He's captured by the bad guys now, but he's going to escape. Because his gonna, thumb is after him. Yeah, he's going to make it back to Necroman. Eventually. Awesome. Yeah, it's... A, it's that, because he's a zombie, so all his bits are still alive. And they want to come back. So if they're, if you were to chop his leg off, it's going to try to roll to him. You know, he's going to try to go to it. But it's such a small piece that it's not registering with him yet because of where he's at in the storyline. He doesn't care about his thumb. He's just figuring out how to survive and, and, and what he is. So it's really a fun book, and we try to take the most obnoxious approach to it in a way, and we never take it seriously. So if you were to look at Invisible, right, as a, as, as a, as a work, and you were to compare it to Necroman, miles apart, right? Obnoxious, fun, serious, good time, right? Um, so Necroman, we never take anything seriously. We try to add like inspirational things in there, but you're not really going to inspire people with a zombie superhero. You can just sort of help them with information and see how it goes. Well, it is the whole contrarian thing, though, because those zombies are always the thing you're supposed to be running away from, but in this case, the zombie's the good guy. So, yeah. 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 Well, they saved a whole pile of kids with his intestines. Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> with, 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 I'm getting it. I'm getting it. With something like Jim Bob John. Which is another book I did. I was just trying to be obnoxious as possible, like straight up offend everybody in one <laughs> shot. Okay. I've done a pretty good job with it, you know. So I try different books. I take different approaches to, and I I can't change my style very much because as you grow as an artist, you'll always find uh, your own style and the consistency of my work looks the same because I follow this process every single day. This is this is the process that I go through. So I'll have a consistency to my work later on. So once we're colored, or once we're scanned off, penciled, inked, we get into colors. Now usually I only got one of these, but when you go to color, When you go to color, you're actually going to color it to scale. So everything, this is to scale right here. This is the size that I work on on my drawing table. So when I'm drawing, this is the size I work on. Uh, because the bigger the piece, the more details you can fit into it. So when you reduce it, it compresses the details, right? You can fit a lot more stuff in a bigger area than you can a smaller area. And that's why we reduce we reduced to 67%. So if 11 by 17 is our format of work, we're going to reduce this by 67% and get to that size right there. That's basically a comic book size right there. So if you look at the differences between, say, the inked version and this, if you were to put these side by side, you'd be like, okay, well, I see his inks in there, but then whenever you add the colors to it, And shrink her down, it looks like there's more detail and less space because you're literally shrinking this stuff down. The size you work at compared to the size you print at is two different things. If you print this, it's going to be an expensive book. That's called an artist edition book, and people love it. Crazy expensive. Expensive to do. Exp 
expensive to buy as a consumer. How do I know? Because I bought them. <laughs> I bought a Jack Kirby collection, which would have been from his early and human days, and it was straight up as pencils and inks, and I'm happier than a fly on crap because what these things will teach you is how the masters approach their craft. Coincidentally, once I bought the Jack Kirby, I then went and bought a Bernie Wrightson um, artist book, non-colored, straight up his line work. Because you basically glean a lot of information from those by seeing how they uh, hit their process. You'll see their brush strokes in there, right? So like they're black. Whenever you scan off to get into your ink, you're going you're gonna to bump your blacks, okay? Because if you were to look at the originals, if you look at the originals, you'll see my markers, my marker strokes in here. Do you see those things? Those are inconsistencies that'll come out at a regular rate. So when you're cleaning it up, you're gonna bump your whites, and you're gonna bump your contrast, and you're gonna bump your black, right? You're gonna take the whole image and just elevate it a little bit more. So you create a playing field, a level playing field, color on it. It's consistent every single time. So when you get to this, it's consistent 100% of the time. What program do you use to color? What I use Photoshop, okay. but there's a bunch of ways to skin this cat. A lot of people use Manga Studio, which is a fraction of the cost. Now, my Photoshop disc is before they switched over to online only, which is a way to milk their yeah. little cow, right? You can't buy a disc anymore, which is garbage. I happened to buy a disc the last year before they switched over, and I did that on purpose because I want the disc. I want the program. I don't want to pay you every month $20, $30, $40 to use it. I want the program, period. And I spent like $600 on it but I have the license for it now, I have the key for it. So anything that I want to do, I can just pull their whatever, I can pull their their filters, I can take whatever they have on their website now and apply it to the, the Photoshop system I have. So you could essentially take Photoshop One, which is a tank. The program hasn't really changed that much. If you look at Photoshop One now, compared to Photoshop One back then, your primary core functions haven't really changed. They just added a bunch of bells and whistles, and I mean a lot of bells and whistles, you know? But it hasn't, the structure hasn't changed. The, the beginning program is the same, right? So you can just keep adding to Photoshop. So if you ever see Photoshop in the wild, <laughs> grab it. Grab it, it might cost you, but if you have the opportunity, get it. Now, the reason I color on Photoshop is because it's a monster. It is the biggest coloring program, period. It is the, everybody uses it. The only reason I bring up the manga is because it's a lot cheaper. It'll get you all the functions you're gonna want to color, but it's not gonna get them all for you, right? It's, you're not gonna get all the bells and whistles that Photoshop provides, like chroming and all sorts of stuff that. I find that true when I was like, handing off stuff from my Procreate, which is, you know, Really dumbed down version, and then Chad had it in um, the Photoshop, and it was like, I can't do that. What you're doing, yeah. so this. But Chad has the same problem, and he doesn't want to rent it. So mm -hmm. he has, if he uses it on his modern computer, modern, his operating system doesn't support the or can't play the old Photoshop. So he had literally has a 12 year old computer mm -hmm. that he treats like. It's made out of gold that runs his Photoshop program, and it's not connected to the internet. It's you know he has to it's put a, yeah he has to put a thumb drive in it to move art over. Uh, like if you email to him, he takes it off one computer and puts it on the other one because he doesn't want to get to the point where his Photoshop stops working. So the advantage of having a disk is that means any computer in the future I get, Photoshop's coming with me. Um, a lot of people will tell you, use whatever works for you. Uh, no matter what you do though, a lot of people are getting into drawing on iPads 
Okay, so there's, happy with it, but uh, uh, there's it's one problem with this. Uh, your DPI, your dots per inch, or, or pixels per inch, or whatever, whatever dots, I, I forget. Your DPI. Chad used to hammer me. Be like, you know, I need to be 350 hours, and you'll wipe out my face. That's exactly what he sounds like. He does. I love the guy. <laughs> I, I, but the comic book companies are going to want you to send it at 600 DPI, which is pushing the maximum what you're going to be able to send. But the reason they want that is that there's no excuse. That's 100% your art, 600 DPI. Might be a monster of a file, but they can take it all in and see what you got going on there. Uh, the smaller you compress DPIs, sure, you can get the line work, but if you start really zooming in, you're going to pixelate. You're going to you're going to chunk out because you're taking 600 dots per inch at this at this. Now, chop that in half and do 300. But now I want you to zoom into here. So as soon as you get here, it's it's frayed out. And um, so the problem with these tablets is this: they'll support that DPI, but it's a it's a big it's a big file. You know, some of these files, like this file in particular, is like 200 megabytes just for the color, okay? You're not going to really support that on your tablet unless you're dedicating that much memory to one image, which is a great way to do it because then you maximize your machine. Um, when we did Necroman 1, we only did it at a Tony Magni who colored grayscaled Necroman 1 did it at 100. What's the maximum an Apple can do? I want to say it was like 129, 130. 140. Yeah. Do you guys, the DPI? I, I can do 300 all the time, but I, I can do 400 even. Okay, well this was probably four years ago and you probably had a cheaper version mm -hmm. of the Apple iPad thing, right? So we got it at 130. So if you look at the printed book of Necroman number one, you'll see it, it pixelates out compared to issues two and three because we hit the standard of 600 after that. So when you say pixelate, you mean there's white through going through? It's, it fuzzies, it blurs, it's not right, tight. It's down to two pixels or those little tiny squares. Yeah, so it doesn't look as beautiful as it means. Correct, and so when it's... you come to the print medium, you, you really only get one shot, right? If you mess it up, you mess it up. And you mess it up on a book scale, you mess up the entire run. So if you find a necroman in the wild uh, and you compare issue one to issue two, you'll see distinctly the, the, the tightness of it all. Where can they find them in the wild? I don't know. Really? I don't know. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's painful. Yeah, well, even... They're all gone? They're all sold? All, wow. all of them. I have, like, some of the rare stuff that I keep for myself, but next year, around my birthday, the publisher is talking about running more prints of the Necroman series because we're just out of them. People like a zombie superhero story, you know, in the past conventions, the, the two conventions that I did in um, Harrisburg, maybe I did three, I don't know. Conventions and appearances start to blur together because it's, no, like, intimate little affairs like this are great because we can talk, but these big conventions are just a mind-numbing thing. So the conventions that I've done this year after the pandemic popped off and I was vaccinated, we just blew through all of our inventory of the past. Issues 1, through one 2, and 3, Necroman, gone, like Jim Bob John is almost gone. You know, people wanted to buy, they were excited to be back out, and then we put them in a with comic book artists and you're just going to get flooded all day long. Um, so anyway, what was I saying? About doing it on that is a great way too. I just prefer this method because this is what I know. You can absolutely do all your illustration on an iPad, right? You can, you can use the same techniques that I use, okay? You can take a blue color, pencil it in, right? And the beauty about 
a digital program is you can actually do this stuff on layers, right? So like, if you wanted to do this on uh, iPad or whatever, you could, and you would layer stuff up, okay? And you'd be able to take it off, put it on, do all that stuff. You can, the same rules apply. You could sketch it out in non-photo blue, which is a spectrum, and all your tablets have that spectrum. When you do that, you can take a black pen, go over it, ink it. You don't need the analog. You don't need the paper. You can do it all digital, but there's one disadvantage to that. The disadvantage to doing it digital is that you don't have the original art to sell. Yeah. I found that to be very true. And, and it's going to sound weird, but there are collectors out there that are just going to wipe you out art-wise, financially. That's awesome, you know? But you're not going to make that sale on a digital thing. You can't be like, here's my original digital. They're going to be like, I don't care. You know, <laughs> off they go. But somebody comes through and they'll look through my portfolio, you'll sell that. So what you see there is my convention. So the longer I have a piece, the more I reduce it. Um, you'll have people go through your stuff. Essentially, that original art is what they want. Some pieces you'll sell for 200 Some pieces can go for... 600 to 1,000, depending on, on what you've done. Now, that's, a, that's money in your pocket for your art that you're not going to get if you do digitally. If you do prints, like a photograph. Sure, you can, do, you can do a limited series print, but a print is always going to be a print. It'll never be that original piece of art. Exactly. And those collectors are going to hound you. I call them like snipers, which I know is a horrible term. No, that's hilarious. Actually, no, hold on, no, no, hold on, ladies. Listen, listen, you'll be at a convention, right? And you'll see him. This is what the dude's going to be doing. He's going to be doing this now for you. Right? Just walking. He's going to hover out here like this. He'll be looking around here like this. And then he's going to be gone. Then the following day, he's going to be coming back. He's going to be watching you again. And before the show ends, he's going to roll right up to you, start going through your portfolio, pick the piece he wants, buy it. Just like that, like it's the weirdest thing ever. Most people that are buying books or $10 prints, they're gonna talk to you. They wanna know all sorts of stuff. These snipers know what they want. They want original art, so they're coming for it, okay? And they're gonna come for you. And they wait two or three days and run the risk that you'll sell it to somebody else? Correct, and it ha it's, it's happened before where if they're, if they're really motivated, you can tell because they're going to have a big portfolio. And you, you spot them a mile away because fans in a convention with a huge Ford or, you know, 30-inch portfolio walking around, hard case plastic, you know what he's doing. He's collecting art, right? And they're going to find their way right to your table. They're all patient. They're all going to sit back, wait in the cut with their little briefcases in their hands, their little portfolios. They're going to wait for you to be done with all your fans, and they're going to come right up to you, start going through your stuff. Usually, there's never, uh, these people aren't, they're not going to barter with you. They're not going to try to talk you down. They're not going to try to do anything. Uh, it's not a negotiation. They're going to buy your art. Um, and the one time I did this, Freddy Krueger piece, and this guy failed to pull the trigger on it. I said, man, I really love that. That's just fantastic. And I gotta go talk to the wife, and I gotta do this. And one of the snipers rolled right up, and he's like, I want that. Because it happened to be a um, piece of art that was used as a promotional thing for the Creature Feature weekend. It's like a giveaway. So a giveaway um, is something that you'll set at a table. So when people come in, you know, they just grab all the giving, the, the gimme stuff, the, the free stuff. So if they were to see something like this, everybody's going to take these things. Then they're going to come find you, right? So like, let's say something that cost me 20 cents, and I get 300 of them done, and I set them out there, right? You're not spending a lot of money, but that's always going to come back to you because people are going to want you to sign it, and then once they're, once they're there in front of you, this is great, but they're going to want to buy more stuff and more stuff. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to get yourself out there. But that...
kicks ass. Like selling original art guys will make up like 50% of my sales. So if you were to go to a show, um, let's let's say Creature Feature Weekend, okay? I'm not bragging, but we did $1,200 worth of sales, okay? They say it was three days, but I don't really ever go Friday because I'm not, call me a, an artist, if you will. Like, I'm not trying to sell all the time. Like, I want to go on Friday. I want to set up my booth, right, with my banners, and then I'm going to go have fun. You know, I'm going to go do my own stuff because I know the next two days I'm not going to get the opportunity to, and I'm not going to miss out. So if I go by a vendor and I see something I want, I'm getting it right then and there because it's not going to be there on Sunday whenever I might have an opportunity to go back. But usually by that time, I'm so burnt out. I'm ready to tear down, yep. go home, right? So with Creature Feature Weekend, half of my sales were original art, right? Horror fans. It's hard to, it's, it's hard to make a lot of money on a $5 book, right? That's like a step-by-step -step kind of a thing. You're plugging away, plugging away, plugging away. Prints are better because it's a bigger sale, right? and it costs less money to produce than a book. Original art is the cheapest thing to produce. I mean, nothing. There's cents worth of material on that piece of original art. The ink is dirt cheap, right? The pencils, nothing. The paper comes out to 27 cents, so it's less than a dollar for the original art, but you'll make hundreds of dollars on that. And that is the complete disadvantage of working digitally. Found that to be very true because I have people want my digital work, but you know you can't sell it for all the amount of time the and energy you put into it. Do you still do analog art? I do. Okay. Yep. And a lot of people will say, "Oh, I love what you did there. Do it." And and I can. I can just take it off there and, and reproduce it on a piece of paper. And so I, when you did, so she did. Uh, you um, for sale. Yeah, but she also did this elephant book, little kids elephant book, but it was all original art. Right. And we scanned her photos, her paintings. She made paintings, watercolors. You sold a lot of those, right? Yep. No, I sold one. Really? Right. Not even two. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So the next part would be, as an artist, is to find your market, right? For me, it's relatively relatively easy because I'm a comic book artist. I get invites to go to comic book conventions. When you put me in a confined space with a bunch of fans. And bring them in, right? And when I bring them You're in, you're a showman, though. Like that, he's a showman. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've now stood. My, my wife calls me a salesman. <laughs> you're a showman, though. You're you're more than a salesman because, yeah. like this one guy last week comes up. He was a hundred if he was twenty. He okay. was this old man who I was really kind of shocked to see him coming over for a comic. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And he's like, come on in, young man, you know, and he's, he's, he's having this really charismatic, really just, and you know what, my definition of a charisma is, when you walk away from a person, you feel better than when you walked up. So people walk up to you, when they walk away, they feel better than they did when they walked up. Good. And this guy was just, he had a spring in his step when he walked away. And, and those people want your stuff. Because they want whatever that little bit of magic was you just sprinkled on them. Right? <laughs> and, and that's really, it's amazing to watch you operate. I appreciate that. That's Thank really fascinating. So, so if somebody stops in front of you, you already have them. Right? So at a convention approach, I'm going to have banners, my name and some art, and side panels with uh, whatever prints I have so like, I can rotate the prints on the side of my banners because I want to grab that person across the room, right? So if they're even approaching you and they get in your little bubble, essentially everything is a sale. That's a sale waiting for you. You know, you just have to figure out how to streamline the process and get them to come just a little bit closer because if they can come a little bit closer and you can pitch them, usually you can make the sale. Not that your art is necessarily a big pitch game, but it is. You want people to buy it. You want people to appreciate it and experience it and sort of buy books and give you feedback and, and all that other stuff. So when you find 
your market, and then your market finds you, and you put yourself in a position to make that easy. You sort of grease the wheels in a way, 